Oh God, when we think about who we are, what we've done, what came out of us by nature, in our thoughts, our motives, our heart attitudes, our actions, our words, and we think of the piles of crimes piled high against you, against your holiness, against your goodness, or we think about our sins against others, and then we sing these words, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, I bear it no more, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. That is our cry. We feel in singing these words, perhaps like Isaiah, confronted with our sin and yet cleansed at the lips by your sacrificial altar. Oh God, you sent your son to be our substitute, to pay for our sins, to qualify us to have access to you, to know you, to be called by your name. And we pray to be useful to you. We pray, even as we just sung, Lord, haste the day. Hurry up. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We long to be home. If this earth is not our home, heaven is our home. We long to be with you. In the time between now and when you graciously take us home, we pray to be useful. Holy, pliable, usable. God, for your purposes and all for your glory, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we are in week two of a five-week interruption of John's exposition of the Gospel of Mark, and we are looking at missions and specifically how ecclesiology or the church works with missions. We've looked at missions as the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ manifested in the church around the world. Last week in particular, we zoomed in on how God uses the church to accomplish His purpose of saving sinners from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. Now, I know some of you have been wondering, perhaps all week, what it is that I received as a note in the middle of the sermon last week from a very sweet lady. Some of you looked concerned and didn't hear anything I said for the next 20 minutes, I thought to eliminate all distractions now, I'm going to read to you this very sweet note. Missions, Matthew 28, sin, John 16, the church, Acts 2, God loves you and so do I. It was not what I expected. I have had less sweet notes (laughs) interrupt sermons. Um... And what was so sweet is this dear lady had on her heart the things that resonate with this church about missions. She identified the texts from which those ideas would come, and she felt compelled to share that with me. I did get her permission this week. I sent her a kind thank you note uh, and thanked her for her kindness and for her insight into those things. Not that I want to start a trend. Um, <laughs> But uh, she gave me permission to uh, share the contents of that with you. I know you were wondering. I want to encourage you this morning, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you have thrown your life into his church, then you are an integral part of a massively successful enterprise. In fact, the only enterprise that is guaranteed to succeed in all of human endeavor. Jesus promised in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And as we saw last week, the pathway from Matthew 28 and the Great Commission to Revelation 5, that great convening of blood-bought saints around the throne of the Lamb, runs right through Romans 10. The equipping, the sending of missionaries, the proclamation of the gospel, the hearing of the word about Christ, and faith. God in His sovereignty uses human means to accomplish an endeavor that will not fail, cannot fail, because He has promised it. And if you're a part of that endeavor, you are part of the most successful enterprise humans will ever be a part of. More than anything else you could ever be involved in, to invest your time in, to give your resources to, to give your life to the church, 
is to give your life to God's program for rescuing sinners unto eternal life. Everything else burns up. Here's a definition of missions that we're working with. The glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ manifested in the church around the world. You're aware of the missionary endeavors that this church has participated in. Wayman Lee has been in a number of countries on a number of continents training pastors to effectively shepherd churches in far-off places. You're perhaps aware of a letter written in 2004 from a tribal villager in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. And the title of that letter is Do Tuck Place Needham Walkman. And Zach and Jeremy and others can correct my pigeon pronunciation. The translation of this letter says, I'm happy to come talk to you guys. We talked about sending a missionary to come to us, but you have not done it, and so we are still waiting. That letter was written in 2004. There was a request for a missionary and then waiting for some time, and then the writing of this letter, and then that letter made its way here, and we read this letter in this church, and a teacher and a software engineer and a tradesman said, we want to answer that letter. And they moved their families to Papua New Guinea. <laughs> and they learned two languages and they learned how to live way off the grid. It, the last time I was there, it literally took me longer to get home from the mountains of Papua New Guinea than it took the Apollo 11 astronauts to return from the moon. It is a difficult place to get to, isolated. And the mountains there are filled with people group after people group in separate languages, separated by forbidding terrain that have no access to God's Word, have no access to the gospel we love and talk about every week, have no access to this, the local church. And so our families went. In the meantime, in fact, in 2015 and 2016, we received five more handwritten letters from other tribes requesting missionaries to come to their talk place, their mother tongue, their own language, and give God's word in their language, teach them to read it, and teach them to truth. The Doming, the Yaut, the Mahdi, the Ku, and then an individual man from which tribe I do not know, all handed letters asking for more missionaries. You know of the church work in Genoa, Italy, Matt Johnston and Massimo Malika, a team working to see the church birthed in a place where the church once was bright and for centuries, even millennia, has been absent. By the way, if you're not receiving updates through the newsletters, either from Wayman Lee or from our team in Papua New Guinea or from Massimo and Susanna in Italy, please stop by the missions table in the hallway and sign up to receive their updates so that you can pray for them weekly, monthly, be aware of what's going on. By the way, it's always helpful for our missionaries on the field to receive missionary letters in reverse, for you to send emails and cards and notes and tell them what God is doing through the church here to take the gospel to unreached people. What I'm going to do now is introduce a video that comes from Genoa, Italy. This is the church there and their first baptism ceremony. And you're going to get to hear a baptism testimony of a woman from Africa who found her way to the church in Italy. And she's fluent in Italian and in English, so you'll hear her English reading of her testimony over the video of her giving her testimony in Italian in the church. And we get to get a flavor of the same things we're about here, Matt and Massimo are laboring for in Genoa, Italy. So I'm going to sit down for about 10 minutes and we get to hear this baptism testimony from Italy. Ciao a tutti. Hello, everyone. 
Before I start, I would like to say thank you to you guys for being here today. And this is my testimony. I grew up in a foster home in Nigeria. And I came to Italy in 2009 with my brother and sister. Growing up, I knew about God, but I wasn't really aware of, of what it meant to, to believe in God. I used to attend churches both in Nigeria and in Italy. I became the church girl. I was always there. I thought it was enough just to go to church. And oftentimes, I would justify my sins. It was normal to go to church on Sunday and hours later go, go, to, go dancing with my friends. It wasn't a big deal. I didn't care about what I watched or what I listened to. I thought I was free because I was already saved. That was what I told myself. I wasn't fully aware of who against whom I had sinned and, and what my sins were. Because Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For me, being a Christian meant just saying it and not necessarily leaving it. And when I wasn't in some places, it meant that I was showing to other people how Christian I was. I measured my sins against those of my friends. And instead of looking at myself in the mirror, I confronted myself with other people. Others were sinners. The ones who killed, the ones who stole, they were sinners, not me. But Psalm 106 verse 6 says, both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity, we have done wickedness. It wasn't very often to hear people talk about sin. Around me, no one talked about holiness or purity. But in 2017, I went to France because I want to, I want um, a scholarship to study abroad in France. It was, an, it was an experience that changed my life. In those months, the Lord showed me my sins. He opened my eyes. Just like the prophet Isaiah says, woe is me for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. As I said before, I stayed in France for five months. It was an experience that changed my life completely. I don't remember the precise day or date, but I do remember that I, I came across a video uh, of, of a very known pastor by the name John MacArthur. I think I understood for the very first time the gospel, listening to his sermons. Listening to those sermons, I understood, thanks to the grace of God, how much of a sinner I was and how much I had sinned against God. I understood for the very first time that I had sinned against the Holy God, that my actions and path and the path that I was taking was completely opposite. And all of a sudden, the words of Paul in Romans started to make sense, which says that not, not just one person, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so had I. I understood that. I understood what it meant when the Bible says it's a good news because none of us, not even, we're not willing to, to accept the grace of God, neither are we willing to follow Christ. I understood that great that I understood that salvation is a grace from God an irresistible grace because it's Christ it's God that's, that searches for us not us that left to ourselves we can never never ever go to him and even even my righteousness as Isaiah says is a filthy rag rag I knew the difference between good and evil because God says in his word that he's put this in the heart of every man. As Paul says in Romans 1, 19, 20, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. 
for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived even since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. By the grace of God, I read the Bible in a year. I started to see my life from a different perspective. The choices I made, the companies I made. I was no longer comfortable in my sins, neither did I justify, justify them anymore. I needed to find a church that was Christ-centered. Where I could grow in the knowledge of God and in the truth of His Word. I wanted to find a church with people who weren't afraid to tell me when I was doing something wrong. In this church, at Luz Evangelica, I have found men and women who love the Lord, people who, with love, tell me when I'm doing something wrong or when I'm taking a wrong path. They're always there to listen to you, to pray with you, to help you, and to help you cultivate a, a, a pure life. All of this I have found in this church. When I, when I think back about my growth, I cannot help but remember what Paul says in the book of Ephesians, where he says that, and you were dead in your trespasses and, and, and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the grace, because of his great love, with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I think about my life today and I cannot help but thank the Lord for what he's done for me because I'm not perfect and I don't think I can ever be perfect in this world but I trust in him completely I trust in the work that he did in my life he saved me and I'm going to work hard every day by his grace to live for him con la sua grazia grazie Thank you, Sandra. That was a beautiful story, and it was just so edifying. Now I want to ask those who are members of our church, those who have become um, official members of Lux Evangelica, to stand up. Um, you can stand up now, um, those of you who are members of the church. And we want to recognize our responsibility towards Sandra seeing as she just is about to become a, a new member of this church. And so you can respond, and I'm going to respond as well, yes, by the grace of God. Will you be committed to, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to love, to encourage, to teach, to re uh, um, re reprove, um, exhort, um, and to console Sandra, desiring that she grows in her understanding of Christ, in his word, and that she lives in, in a way that's consistent with everything that her baptism represents, yes, by God's grace. Okay, you can sit down. Sandra, because of your clear testimony of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, and because of the clear evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> 
Yes, I turned myself off. I'm back on now. That is so encouraging. And even though they're speaking different languages, uh, most of those people none of us have met, and yet you see the same God doing the same things through the same gospel, building his church around the world. So thrilling to be a part of. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. I want us to see the blueprint that God has laid out for us for missions. How does one do missions equals how does one follow God's blueprint for the church? As we looked at last week, the church is God's vehicle to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and fulfill the Great Commission. So when we ask the question, how does one do missions, we really need to be asking, how does one do the church? What is the blueprint for the church? And, the God, and God has given us instructions for that very thing. He has not left us in the dark. He has not left us to make it up as we go. But as Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15, he says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. And if you follow those instructions, you, you come across instructions in those letters like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus about evangelism, discipleship, preaching and teaching, the training of pastors, everything in those pastoral letters and everything in the letters of the New Testament directing churches how to operate. There are a number of places we could turn to look at God's blueprint for the church. We'll look at the one that John Anderson brought up this morning in Equipping Hour, Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll pick this up in verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 11, and read through verse 16. Jesus gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love." This is God's blueprint for the church, and we're not going to be able this morning to dive into the depths of this section, but I want to highlight what this passage is doing, how God is instructing what churches should be like, what the local assembly of believers should be and how it should operate. And the first thing we're going to notice in God's blueprint here in Ephesians 4 is the Lord's own provision. What is the provision of the Lord for His church? Verse 11. He gave some, and the he here is Christ. Christ Jesus gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. What has the Lord provided? He has provided the truth of his word, he's provided gospel heralds, and he's provided pastor teachers. That unfolds in these three layers of leadership that God has given to the church. The first layer you see there in verse 11 is apostles and prophets. And the order of those is important. That indicates that the prophets he's detailing here are not Old Testament prophets, but New Testament prophets. Ephesians 2.20 lists the apostles and prophets as the foundation layer of the church, which was birthed in Acts chapter 2. And the church is built on apostolic doctrine, that is the New Testament teaching about the Christ, what He came and what He did, the teaching about the church, the teaching about what it means to be a learner or a disciple of Christ and to follow all of His commands. That is apostolic doctrine. It was given by God through the apostles and the New Testament prophets as the first layer, the foundation layer of the church in the first generation. And while the apostles and prophets have moved off of the scene in successive generations, we don't have them today. We have the apostolic doctrine. We have the teaching which comprises the New Testament, which is the truth of God's Word, which is the foundation of the church. God also gave gospel heralds, those who faithfully proclaimed the truth of the good news, the gospel. 
These are the evangelists, a noun form of the, of the ones who would proclaim the evangel, the good news, those who would proclaim the truth of Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross for the salvation of sinners. And Jesus gave to the church pastors and teachers. Uh, that is, uh, probably one office should be hyphenated, pastor, teacher. The idea is a shepherd and one who instructs and cares for God's people with the Word of God. These are gifts by Jesus to the church. That is the Lord's provision in His blueprint for the church. After His provision, we see in verses 12 and 13 the purpose of the Lord's provision, and that is the equipping of Christians for ministry. The equipping of Christians for ministry to bring about unity, knowledge, and maturity in Christ. Look down at verse 12. Notice carefully why Jesus gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. For the equipping of the saints. The saint, by the way, is not some mysterious historical figure who did a bunch of miracles and was canonized by the church. Saint just means Christian, a separated one. Someone bought by the blood of Christ and living for him. And God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers for the equipping of Christians for ministry. Here, the work of service. To the building up of the body of Christ. What is the work of ministry of Christians? It's aimed at building up the church. And that is to bring about a unity and a knowledge and a maturity in Christ. Look at verse 13. To what end or to what degree is the body of Christ to be built up by Christian ministry, all of us laboring together? Until we all attain, verse 13, to the unity of the faith. That is, our unity together brought about by our unity with God's mind, God's truth in His Word. Until we attain to that unity of the faith, until we attain to that knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, a knowledge of Christ and a unity in His Word, bringing about a maturity that is measured by the fullness of the stature that belongs to Christ. In other words, how do we know if the church is mature? The church is mature to the degree that it conforms to Christ Himself. The standard is not some arbitrary human standard. The standard is Christ. The standard is not the best Christian you know. The standard is Christ. The standard is not what other churches are doing. The standard is Christ. And so Christians are to be equipped by pastors and teachers for the work of ministry to bring about this unity in the faith, this deeper and deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ, and a greater and greater maturity brought about bringing about conformity to Christ himself. The result of the Lord's provision we see in verses 14 and 15. As a result, Paul says, verse 14, the result of that is stability, discernment, truth, and growth. Look carefully at verse 14. As a result, as a result of Jesus giving these leaders to the church for the equipping of the saints for ministry, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. That is, the church is to be stable. And as we grow, as we mature, as we labor with one another under the Word of God, we grow in our conformity to Christ in our maturity according to the fullness of the stature of who Christ is. We grow in our knowledge of and love for Jesus himself, and we are unified in God's truth. There will be a resistance to those winds and waves which would otherwise shake the church. When the big bad wolf blew down the house of straw, when the big bad wolf blew down the house of, this is a fictional story, by the way, <laughs> blew down the pig's house of sticks, and then the big bad wolf was confronted by the house of brick. And all the howling and huffing and puffing he could muster could not, could not knock down that house. The church is to be built up in like fashion. Not blown about by the waves and the winds of trickery and deceit, deceitful scheming, and every doctrine that blows through town. The church is to have stability and discernment. Notice verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow. 
truth, truth in love. Those two go together. They're never at odds. If you hold on to truth but aren't loving, you don't really apprehend the truth correctly. If you think you love but you're not articulating truth, then you're not really loving well. These things always go hand in hand. They're never enemies in the church. And then the result of the Lord's provision of all of these things is growth. We are to grow up in all aspects into Christ, into Him who is the head of the body, even Christ. And then as John pointed out in Equipping Hour this morning, verse 16 is sort of the apex of this and really kind of a surprise statement. If you ask the question, who causes the growth of the church? You would say, well, Jesus does. You would say that it's the Holy Spirit's role, empowering believers. And then in verse 16, you would say the body causes the growth of the body. The body is the, the metaphor, a physical body as a metaphor for the church. We are an interdependent, organic community. We depend on one another. You can't cut off your thumb, sit, let it take a hike and say, I didn't need that thumb anymore. The thumb can't function apart from the body and the body doesn't function well without a thumb. It is a great illustration for how we are to relate to one another. We are an interdependent organic unity. And it is that interdependent organism that causes the growth of the organism. Look at the details here in verse 16. From whom the whole body skip down to the end, causes the growth of the body. And there's a jumble of words in between. But the main sentence here is the body causes the growth of the body. And that action is modified by a, of a couple of really important phrases. Phrases that we need to understand so that each of us understands our place, our role in God's blueprint for the gospel going to the ends of the earth. Because this is the blueprint for your activity in God's plan in the local church. The whole body being fitted and held together by every joint of the supply according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body. Two really important parts here. If the body is going to cause the growth of the body, if we together, an organic unity, are going to participate together and labor together successfully for the growth and maturation of the church, two things must be true. First of all, we must be fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. And the word joint here is not our uh, sort of modern medical word for joint. You might be thinking elbow or knee or something like that. Uh, but in, in Greek, in the first century, the word for joint here just meant every place where some part of a physiology met some other place. So ligaments, tendons, sinews, uh, bone joints, and all the rest would be included here. Every point where one part of a body met with another part of a body, they had to be fitted and joined together. At every joint of the supply, and the idea of supply here is the supply of vitality and life for the growth of the whole. Now, what that means for us, if, if we take the metaphor into reality, is you and I have to be together. You can't just be a lone sinew somewhere and expect to be of help to the body, nor can you expect to thrive individually. God's blueprint for Christians is the blueprint for the local church. We were designed by God to be a part of this interdependent, organic unity that functions together to bring about the growth of the whole. We have to be together, fitted together. And if we look at other places where Paul, by the Holy Spirit, uses this metaphor of a body, we understand that the Holy Spirit places each in the body as He so fits gifting each for the express and specific purposes of service in the church. So we don't complain, I'm, I'm an armpit, not a thumb, I really wanted to be a thumb. <laughs> however God made you, however God has gifted you, be there, fit it in, and serve. And it is vital to the health and the growth and the maturation and the unity and the stability of the body. The second key aspect here, aside from being together, held together by every joint of the supply, we have the proper working of each individual part. Do you see that in verse 16? According to is a preposition indicating standard. There, there, is, a, there is a standard of the functionality of the church that cannot be met apart from the proper working of the individual parts. So not only do we have to be together, 
But you individual Christian must be operating on all cylinders. And to the degree that you are not functioning properly spiritually, you actually stunt the growth of the church. You actually cripple the vitality of God's vehicle of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Listen, we have to be together or the church is stunted in its growth. And each individual Christian must be working properly. Just think by way of illustration. If you've been tracking well with the Lord this week and you've been reading your Bible, you've been confessing sin, uh, you've been putting scripture into your heart, you've been praying, what happens when you bump into another Christian in this church? All of that stuff just spills out. And your encouragement in the Lord becomes an immediate encouragement to the other Christians you run into. They're encouraged by what God's doing in your life, and then you're encouraged by their encouragement over what God's doing in your life, and the growth is greater than the sum of its parts. And think about the other way around. You haven't been confessing sin, uh, you've become stagnant in your pursuit of Christ, you're not reading your Bible, you're not putting God's Word into your heart, uh, you're not putting sin to death, you're not praying, you're not sharing the gospel with others, and the spiritual vitality of your own life has been sapped. What happens when you interact with other believers in the local church? Wah, wah, wah. You're left talking about sports or politics or the weather just to make small talk and conversation and maintain some level of friendship. And... But the spiritual vitality is not there. And the not working according to, uh, not the, the, how do I say this? You're not working properly. And the improper working of the individual part stunts the growth of the whole. It's just critical, Christians, that we be together and as individuals, we work properly. And what is the result of that? Of the Lord's provision for leaders that equip saints to do ministry, and then saints as individual parts of a body, interdependent on one another and working properly, come together, the church grows. And the church grows. This is a blueprint for how church is to be. This is not just a blueprint for uh, how churches ought to operate. This really is the blueprint for how Christians ought to operate. It is unbiblical. It is a matter of disobedience for Christians to think, oh, I can just live apart from the church and be a Christian on my own. I am the church all by myself in my living room. Uh, that is not God's blueprint. This also becomes the blueprint for us for missions. That's what we were talking about last week. That's what we'll be covering in the next few when we think about missions, we must think about the church. The church is God's vehicle for taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And I want us to think through some implications for God's blueprints for the church. Ephesians 4 is one of them. But what are the implications of a robust ecclesiology for our thinking about missions? Let me begin just by thinking about ecclesiology and evangelism. It has been a trend to think of missions simply in terms of the gospel. Uh, maybe the Romans Road, a, a four-point gospel tract, just broadcasting the good news of Jesus' death for sinners. That is critically important to the task of missions. But that in and of itself is not the task of missions. If we go back to Matthew 28, what we looked at last week in the Great Commission, what did Jesus say? Make disciples, not just present the gospel. Showing the Jesus film on a frontier, hoping to get a movement started, is not a great mission strategy. It does not follow God's blueprint for the church, which is his strategy to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Listen, I don't want to be in a place where I'm ever criticizing somebody who has sacrificed and taken up courage to boldly proclaim the gospel where the gospel is not known. That takes fortitude and courage. But what I would strike at is an intentional strategy that ignores the church in God's plan to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. What if somebody came to faith in a churchless missions strategy? Well, immediately you have someone who ostensibly loves Christ but is left alone <laughs> rather than 
placed in a body, growing in their maturity, following God's design for how Christians as individuals grow and Christian communities grow. What would it be like to be a, a Christian all by yourself with really minimal knowledge of, the, of God's word, with no qualified leadership, no preaching and teaching, no church discipline, no Lord's table, no baptism, no corporate gathering for instruction, mutual encouragement, for equipping of the saints, and for public corporate worship? Well, you could not possibly be living up to the New Testament definition of a Christian. And so our strategy for missions cannot leave these things behind. We cannot be content merely with evangelism. And when we think about doing evangelism in our own neighborhoods, whether it's Guadalupe or Mill Avenue on Thursday nights, whether it's in your own neighborhood with your friends on your sports teams or at school or in your workplace, is a robust ecclesiology in your heart and in your mind as you're proclaiming Christ. Because someone who comes to faith in Christ is going to be placed by the Holy Spirit and gifted by the Holy Spirit into a body. That's His design. That ought to be our design, our aim. Secondly, let's think about ecclesiology and Bible translation. We are deeply indebted to Wycliffe, Coverdale, Tyndale, those uh, those heroes of church history, particularly heroes of, of Western civilization and the English language, to have God's Word in print in our own tongue. We dare not take it for granted. It is a a staggering, staggering gift that God has given us in our own language. We take it for granted. It's easy to do. According to the Wycliffe website, there are 3,945 languages with no scripture at all. 3,945, comprising some 255 million people that have zero access to God's word of any portion in their language. There are 738 languages with some work in progress. There are some 1,193 languages, according to Wycliffe, that are not vital enough languages to even plan a translation work, either languages that are dying out Um, people learning trade languages or moving out of tribal areas. But there are still 2,014 languages that need a translation work to even begin. Those are staggering numbers. This tugs at our heartstrings, right? When we think about the, the engine for missions, there is this compelling external need There also ought to be for us an internal compelling drive, part of our DNA that I've been rescued, I want to tell others. And the fact that we have God's Word in our own language ought to produce in us this compelling drive to see other people who don't have God's Word in their language to get God's Word. But Bible translation must be tied to evangelism discipleship, teaching, and efforts at planting and strengthening local churches. It is a sad state of affairs in the world of Bible translation today that in a rush to meet the need, and it is a staggering need, that Bible translation products are often put out without thought to churches being planted to discipleship being carried out, or even to evangelism being done. And what a tragedy it is. I've read a number of reports of tribes receiving full translations of the Scriptures in boxes, sitting in a tribe, going unread. Why? Because those who are so eager to finish a translation work and get a translation product in place did not do evangelism. They said, well, that's not our job. And they haven't done discipleship, and they haven't had a heart to see a church birthed. Listen, Bible translation works are critical to the needs of the world today to hear about Christ. But Bible translation works will not accomplish the task that God designed the church to accomplish. In a rush to meet the need, 
the church has been left behind. We need to think about the church in terms of not only how Bible translation is done, but the kind of Bible translations that are done. The Bible was not designed by God merely to be a gospel tract, sort of a four-point Romans Road introduction to Jesus. But God gave His Word in human language to have His own mind and heart known about everything He sought to reveal. What we must give in a Bible translation is the entire counsel of God's Word, accurate and understandable. And I recognize I'm, I'm speaking in the ideal here, and we're talking about very difficult work. Sit with Zach and Cassidy and ask them, how do you translate the Bible into a tribal language? Oh, it's easy. You just... No, it's not easy. <laughs> this is a life labor of love, hard work. But the goal of a good Bible translation is that the whole counsel of God's Word be available in the receptor language, all that is necessary for life and for godliness, accurate and understandable, it needs to be readable, it needs to be studyable, and it needs to be preachable. There have been a number of translations that have tried so hard to be readable that they have left behind accuracy. They've, in fact, tried to replace the church with a translation product. Remember, God gave the church evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. Pastors and teachers will be teaching God's Word. Bible translation uh, projects have sought to, how do we think, how do we put the Bible in the language of a tribal people who are literate for the first time? How do we make it understandable to a newly literate kindergarten level reader? My friends, that is not the goal of good Bible translation. The goal of good Bible translation is to put God's Word and the whole counsel of God's Word accurately into the receptor language and then to have people in place that can teach it and teach people to study it for themselves and to study beyond the first generation of believers, but actually to be able to teach up-and-coming pastors how to handle God's Word accurately in that language and in turn teach the tribe. This is a long, hard process. But an ecclesiology helps fill the gap of where an improper view of Bible translation has left the church out. And Bible translators have sought to, to see a first-generation translation accomplish all that needs to accomplish, and it cannot. Bible translation cannot replace what the church is supposed to be. A third implication, let's think about ecclesiology and discipleship. Again, Jesus said in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples. Disciple is a mathetes, a learner, the one who follows after Christ and takes from him. And Jesus said, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Discipleship is critical. And ecclesiology means that that discipleship happens in the context of observing all that Jesus commands in the New Testament, which includes the expression of local churches. Local churches governed by qualified men, taught the truth, understanding all that it means to be the church. You can't have a follower of Jesus who says, I'm not going to do what Jesus directed. I'm not going to live under the organism that Jesus designed. Our ecclesiology must shape our discipleship. We might think of a fourth implication, ecclesiology and counseling. Omri Miles is going to do a three-week series in Equipping Hour on the relationship between biblical counseling and the local church. It's helpful to understand that counseling, whether it's preventive counseling, i.e. discipleship, or crisis counseling, my life is a mess, somebody help me, is the role of the church. Paul said that he was confident of the Roman believers that they were able to counsel one another. And we believe that with all our hearts. One of the equipping for ministries that pastors do in this church is equipping all believers to be able to admonish one another with the Word of God. 
to be in each other's lives. And so counseling happens at a number of levels. The shepherds in this church counsel people at a preventive and a crisis level. We're involved with biblical counseling of the East Valley that, the, that is designed to help train people well to counsel from the Word of God. A counsel happens in our small groups, and counsel happens at coffee with a friend when someone says, I want to leave my husband. What do I do? What does a believer do? Call the experts. Open God's Word together. We need to be able to do these things. A fifth implication for ecclesiology is thinking about ecclesiology and the training of pastors. John talked about it this morning in equipping hour. If you weren't here for that, you need to listen to that lesson. You need to listen to that message. The historical record of the churches in Geneva that were busy about the training of pastors, that were busy about sending those pastors out in the great missionary enterprise that was about six decades of a vital church in Geneva. The training of pastors is the church's responsibility. And and historically, when the church has failed to train pastors, other institutions have come alongside and said, hey, where are we going to get pastors? We better train them. And then when those institutions, academies and schools were training pastors, the church said, oh, look, they're training pastors. We don't need to. And a vicious cycle has emerged where it almost seems automatic that if if somebody wants to be trained for pastoral ministry, where do they go? Seminary. Off somewhere. And where should they go? What is the best incubator for pastoral ministry? What is the best place to learn and train pastoral ministry under pastors in the local church? What's the best place to train for missionary enterprise in the local church? And so the church must have in its DNA the love of reproduction, the love of expansion by God's design. And we must value the local church's role in that. Sixthly, let's think about ecclesiology and church planting. Ecclesiology and church planting. Churches must plant churches. Churches must plant churches. If churches don't reproduce themselves, where will churches come from? Is there some factory out there that isn't a church that somehow knows what churches should be and do and then makes them? God's plan is that disciple-making disciples would make disciples and that faithful churches would replicate themselves throughout church history until haste the day the Lord comes back. That is our task Let's think, sixthly, ecclesiology and church planting, and you. How do you fit into that? How do you fit into God's great design to take the gospel to every tongue and tribe and nation and people? Well, it's right here in Ephesians 4. Be the church. Be fitted and held together by every joint of the supply, and you individual parts work properly. An unhealthy church is not fit to plant churches. A church stunted in its growth is not going to be very good at training pastors for another generation or training church planters for far off lands. A church improperly working with a majority of its people as sort of auditors to some entertaining exercise on Sunday morning. I don't know how entertaining this really is. But if you view yourself as some sort of a consumer that gets a product put forth by some specialized people up front, you don't have a biblical picture of the church. But to see all of you as intentionally connected to one another, pursuing the Lord faithfully and causing the growth of the body, you have a vital part to play in planting churches across the street and at the ends of the earth. All of this, by the way, is slow work. It is hard work. It's not glamorous. It's not flashy. You you can't just every week put up a new update and say, look at all the work we've done. No, you put your hand to the plow in these things and you look back decades later at God's faithfulness. It is unglamorous. It is mundane. 
Look, we, we think about Zach and Cassidy, and you guys are heroes. We see you every once in a while. And it's like, look what's been done. And you go to work every day and you do the same old thing. Put one foot in front of the other and just do the laborious, hard work of the next day. It's not glamorous. It's long, slow, hard work. And we do that in faith in God's plan and faithfulness in the work that God gives each of us to do. So you've heard that we as elders want to plant a church in New Orleans under Omri's leadership. He's been training to that end. His heart has been beating that way for a decade. And we want to send him. And we want to send some of you with him. And we mentioned last week that we want to be involved in local church planting. Planting here in this valley, which is a desert. Uh, not just topographically, climatologically, but ecclesiologically. For some of you, church planting sort of has a bad ring to it. You've heard of a church splant. It's kind of a church, is that a plant or a split? What happened? And this might be a little bit inside baseball, but some of us have never seen church planting done in a good way. Some have gone after building empires for themselves and branding and putting their brand on every new outcropping of thing that happens to make a name for themselves. Perhaps you've seen churches try to get rid of someone on leadership. How do we get rid of this person that lots of people love but we really can't stand him anymore? Plant a church with him. You're laughing. Maybe someone's discontent, disgruntled, and anti-authoritarian. I just, I got to blaze my own trail. I'm going to plant my own church, do things my own way. Maybe churches have planted out of doctrinal differences. But we just can't come to unity and agreement over what the scriptures say on this issue. It's just going to be easier if we go our separate ways. And maybe you've seen personality conflicts or a moral failure or a financial scandal driving a church plant. Maybe you've seen churches defect from the truth and the remaining faithful just try to figure out what do we do next. I guess we've got to start something. But a healthy New Testament church multiplying, unfortunately, that is a rarity in our day. For a healthy New Testament church to plant an autonomous, biblically qualified, led local assembly of believers seeking to do the blueprint of Ephesians 4, living out the gospel and taking the gospel where it's not known, far too rare. And yet that is God's plan. Church planting has been a part of the conversation at Grace Bible Church for at least a decade. And should the Lord allow us to be established and to grow, we as a church have desired to plant before we outgrew our ability to shepherd in fact, the purchase and the build-out of this very building was designed to accommodate the size of a church that we believed we could responsibly shepherd. And our desire has been to plant a church locally before we outgrew this facility. We are on a pathway to outgrow this facility by the fall. And this means more than numbers. The, the kind of growth that we're talking about here is the growth we just looked at in Ephesians 4. A maturity in our knowledge and our discernment and our growth in Christ. It means the training of leaders and the training of more men to become leaders down the road. And our plan is to plant a church in the Southeast Valley under the leadership of Josh Kelso. And the goals there are to locally shepherd a significant population of this church that lives out in that direction and has prayed for a faithful church in that vicinity. They've been driving a long way for a long time. In fact, many of you in this church have prayed to this end since you started coming to this church. You came to this church hoping that this church would plant in the East Valley. Are there are other reasons to aim at this right now, to meet the needs of sheep who are without shepherds in the Southeast Valley. In, in recent days, a number of churches have imploded and dismantled and defected for various reasons, and there are God's people wandering about the East Valley looking for a home where the truth is proclaimed, where godly men shepherd God's people. 
And it is an acute need. And then to think about providing a gospel witness in a very churchless area. Southeast of us is a growing population center with LDS wards on every corner. The truth is desperately needed. When you think about church planting, there is a spectrum of ways to go about meeting that need. We might think of a, you know, cutting off a live oak tree and taking that oak tree and putting it somewhere else, hoping for the best for that one and hoping something grows out of the stump back here. That's on one end of the spectrum. Another end of the spectrum is to take a couple of seeds and throw them to the wind and hope they land in good soil and see what happens. Our ideas about a church plant are neither one of those. They're somewhere in the middle. You could split a live oak tree in half and hope for the best for both. You could plant a sapling. And we're probably closer over to this area here. We'll unfold some of this a little bit, but I put that illustration in front of you to help you understand where our hearts are as elders. We want Grace Bible Church to be a healthy, robust, strong sending church that can continue to follow the blueprint of Ephesians 4, to train pastors and missionaries to send them out, and to support a young church as it grows, as it grows in its maturity to one day replicate itself. That is the goal. We want to see an independent, autonomous, local church planted that has all of the nutrients, the servants, the equipping, the equipment that it needs to do well, to grow, to be strong. We want to talk a little bit about principles over the next few weeks, whether to go or whether to stay. If you've decided that already, you're ahead. The cart's before the horse. We want to help think about that just a little bit. Listen, we do not make decisions about, I want to be part of the church plant or I want to be part of here, out of personal convenience. What's going to be the easiest way for me to fit church into my otherwise selfish and busy life? That's not the goal. The goal must be, I want to be a strategic part of seeing a new church get off the ground. It's going to need servants, it's going to have ministries, it's going to need body life. I want to be a part of that. Or, I want to be a part of helping Grace Bible Church continue to be a robust and strong church that's able to send out churches, train men, equip saints. Many of you have been longing for and praying for a church plant east of here for the better part of a decade. Some of you have looked in neighbors' eyes as you've shared the gospel and then invited them to come be with God's people at church and they've said, it's in Tempe. What a great thing to be able to invite neighbors to a local body of believers. You've longed for that. We want to help you think through some important principles in making a decision to be a strategic part. Josh will be preaching on July 25th uh, unveiling his heart in all of these things. Uh, there, after that will be a series of informational meetings that you can participate in, hear more details, and we'll get to kind of hear from you who's interested and who's not. And don't be surprised if elders ask you to, be, to actually consider being part of a strategic church plant when you weren't thinking about it before. And don't be surprised if elders ask you to stop thinking about it. <laughs> We need a healthy home church and a strong church plant. Some of you have asked about participating in upcoming ministries here at GBC. If we're talking about a church plant, should I sign up for this and that and the other thing? Yes. <laughs> the 2021 to 22 church schedule and plans are still in place. Don't let discussions of a church plant stop you from signing up for membership class, for baptism if you're a believer and haven't been baptized for BUILD, our men's discipleship, for the women's discipleship in Wellspring, for the trust, if that applies to you, for the women's conference, or for being a vital part of a small group. Go do church. Do all those things. Those will, in fact, equip you to be an intentional, vital part of a sending church or a church plant. What are our expectations about how both churches move forward in a healthy way? We want to protect the maturity, the leadership of a home church, we want to protect the maturity of GBC, 
for the Expositor Seminary and training pastors and for future church planting. And we want to maintain the strength of a planted church to thrive and grow and reproduce itself. That's the aim. Church planting will be costly. You're thinking about it already. You're looking around at faces and you're thinking, who's going? Who's not going? Ministry is always costly. Church planting is costly. I'm reminded of the Moravian missionaries. They couldn't get into Caribbean islands because the slave traders owned those islands and wouldn't let anybody but slaves and slave masters on the islands. And so Moravian missionaries sold themselves into slavery to become slaves, to go to those Caribbean islands to preach the gospel to slaves. They knew it was a one-way trip. And when they stood on the docks and their families waved goodbye to them for the last time, they said famously, may the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. John was giving us the history of the church in Geneva. I read last year that just in one small span of time, 155 French pastors went out from Geneva back to their homeland to preach and to plant churches. Of those 155 cataloged, Maybe eight were not martyred. It was costly. For us to think about the real cost of, of relationships is, is real, it's serious, it will be costly, but it is a cost that is worth it. The lamb will indeed receive the reward of his sufferings and we get to be a participant in his efforts which cannot fail. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these reminders today. Thank you for your word and for your blueprint. Thank you that we do not have to fly blind in this great task you've called us to. We thank you that our captain, the Lord Jesus Christ, our chief shepherd, is the one who shed his blood to purchase people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, and his blood will not fail. And we pray that we would labor as those who recognize that you use means to the ends of bringing people to yourself, we would long to be those means. Let us be ceaseless proclaimers of the gospel, laborers in your church, fitted together and properly working all for your glory, that you might receive your reward in Jesus' name. Amen.